And you led something like 70 ambushes in, in Vietnam and yeah. you're up, you're up North. And for those that are, that are listening, you're fighting pretty, the, the NVA up there. So the Viet Cong, yeah. the last time we're down South, but you're yeah. fighting NVA up, up North and you're, you're leading 70 some ambushes. Um, what was that typical loadout? And, and you're carrying things like, like you have an M16, but you have, you have a shotgun. I think you carried a Swedish K at some point and yeah. like all sorts of things going on. But what was your typical loadout when you guys got ready and you, you headed out to execute one of these ambushes? Yeah. So when I got there, uh, there were three lieutenants, no executive officer, no company commander. Uh, and we, we burned through a bunch of them. Uh, I'm looking at the, the basic load was probably pretty close to 75 pounds. I mean, every one of the things I did with my Marines is everybody's going to carry their first aid pack in the same place. You're going to carry your bayonet in the same place. I don't care what you like. You're going to do it this way. Because if you get wounded and I need hand grenades, I know where to look for them. Or I need ammo. Or any of the kinds of things you need, radio batteries. So every one of my Marines, for example, would carry a mortar round. Because every time I went out on an ambush, I wanted that 60 millimeter mortar right there with me so we could adjust it very quickly on the ground in the middle of an ambush, get some loom up, particularly if it's at night, those kinds of things. You know, I, in fact, it's probably the only medal I actually deserve. I mean that. I mean, I, I trained them very, very well on how to kill people. And you know what I'm talking about, because you've been there, done that. Uh, I'm not, I'm not particularly euphoric about that. If we hadn't killed them, they would have killed us. Uh, but I can recall today, almost every one of those ambushes I was on personally. Uh, we never took a casualty on an ambush. We always killed them, captured some. Uh, I would go through the packs of, of the guys if you had time in the kill zone. Uh, you'd clear, if, if you didn't fire your claymores, it was, it was usually easier to do. As you know, gunshots don't make as many holes in bodies as a claymore mine. Uh, almost every one of those resulted in dead enemy, some live. Taking prisoners is important, particularly up on the DMZ. Interestingly enough, when I take a map off a North Vietnamese Army soldier, usually an officer, uh, there was no DMZ showing on it. And they, <laughs> they truly had been trained and indoctrinated that this is all one country. Yeah. And uh, I remember one of the ambushes, we had to bring a, a, a prisoner of war back because the Paris peace talks had just started early. I guess it's early 1969. And we had to bring back a prisoner to prove that he, he was in the DMZ. And we did. So our guys got very, very good at ambushes. So good that I grew up hunting and fishing. My dad taught my brothers and me how to hunt, how to fish. I did not hunt again for another 20 years. Wow. And I just, it, it, it lost it. Yeah. The guy who talked me into coming back to doing that was a fellow by the name of Joe Foss, mm -hmm. Medal of Honor recipient from World War II. Uh, he's the guy who brought me to the NRA. He's the guy that bought me my first life membership. Wow. And I bought a bunch of those since then for, for my family members. I, I look at that experience of going back to hunting as something that kind of renewed me. Interesting. That I'd lost the taste for it yeah. with all those ambushes. I can see that. If you run it out, it's about one every three days out of the 13 month tour. It's and and it's not just doing the ambushes. You were on the receiving end of ambushes and oh, yeah. attacks as, as well. Yeah. And uh, would you, when you think back and you remember, I mean, you think about this and it's obviously still very clear, like almost yesterday. Um, how did Private First Class Johnson's uh, death impact your life going forward? And then any leadership lessons um, out of that first, experience? First Marine to die in my arms. Uh, you know, I've, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been to the wall. Uh, and every time I go, it's a very emotional experience because there's the names of the guys and the dates in which they died. Uh, the worst day of my life uh, was the 28th, the night of the 28th, 29th of July, 1969. Lost more Marines around me, a company commander, a platoon commander, seven Marines dead, 19 wounded. Unforgettable. And to this day, that's a bad day for me, the 29th of July, 28th, 29th of July. Uh, Johnson was the very first. He was hit, uh, killed instantly. Not, he did not die instantly, like the letter to his family said. 
It took him about four hours to die. It was a, in the middle of a terrible rainstorm. We'd been probed, the little position we had out in the mountains. And uh, it took him about four hours to die. And, and that's a terrible experience. I mean, our corpsman tried like the Dickens to save his life, worked over him the whole time until he finally died. And you, you were wounded uh, a couple times here. And uh, what struck me about some of, of, of one of these times is that today you'd be flown home. You'd be going to Germany. You'd be flown home to the United States. Uh, you would not be going back to lead your men like you did after they drained your lungs. I mean, you got right back in it yeah. and you're wounded in ambush. You go into triage and you, you talk about hearing the doctors around you putting people in these different triage categories. And for those that are listening, um, if you don't know what that is, it's, uh, hey, this person's not going to make it. They're expectant. They're going over here. Uh, you're going over here. Sometimes they have colors attached to that or ha depending on the situation. But uh, but uh, somebody puts you in the right place and you get uh, your lungs drained and then you get right back to your unit. Well, yeah, I actually, I was actually wounded five times. Five uh, times. The rule in the day, in those days, 68, 69, uh, and I guess it was even before that. Uh, 68 and 69 are the two bloodiest years of the Vietnam War. Uh, we were averaging 38 or 39 dead a day in Vietnam at that point. And uh, the uh, 25th of May, 1969, uh, the lead platoon was hit going up. I actually had dysentery. So I was not the lead platoon commander going up and ambushed by a North Vietnamese Army battalion one small rifle company, not even up to full strength of 210 Marines. And uh, my orders were passed through. I have no recollection of saying the words fixed bayonets. Uh, I was carrying at the time a Model 12 military version of the Model 12 Winchester. It has a bayonet lug on it. And at one point, uh, a hand grenade went off very close to me, uh, cut through my hand and lodged in the cocking mechanism of the shotgun. And I couldn't cock it, so I used my 45 the rest of the way up that hill. It took us about four and a half hours to make it to the top, drove the enemy off it, a lot of airstrikes, a lot of artillery, and some very, very brave machine gunners who went with me. And we got to the top of the mountain. The company commander had already set up an LZ for medevac and the wounded. Thankfully, we didn't lose any killed, but we had a lot of people wounded. And when we got to the top of the hill, we put up a perimeter, you know, pursuit by fire. Uh, both indirect fire from Camp Carroll with the artillery and airstrikes. And the, the company commander comes up to me and, and he's carrying my shotgun. And, it, it's, and it, we're now medevacking guys from the bomb craters that were further back down the hill. We're right on the DMZ, literally. The, the red line of the DMZ was right where we were. And from there, we launched an attack into the DMZ to get a prisoner of war. And so he's got the shotgun with him. He says, Lieutenant, what's the idea? And I said, well, sir, if you don't notice, you can't cock it. And once you can't cock it, you can't clear the one you just shot. And so I dropped it on the ground. I used my 45. And he looked at me. He says, it is still a perfectly good bayonet carrier and a club. And it's government property. <laughs> I was, it's tricking my chain. But that, that's the kind of report we had. When you go, I was medevac the next day uh, by helicopter back to Delta Med, which was the triage hospital for the hospital ships. And, and I have no recollection of this, but I was told about it later. The division commander was there in the triage. There were 60 some odd wounded guys from our company and then and the next Lima company, commanded by a fellow by the name of Krulak, by the way, hmm. who becomes Commandant of the Marine Corps wow. later on. And Krulak had been wounded the night of the 25th. And I got moved, met back the next day. And I had no recollection of the event that General Davis described, because General Davis was the division commander. General Davis had been a lieutenant colonel in World War II, awarded a Navy Cross at Peleliu. He was awarded the Medal of Honor and the breakout from the Frozen Chosen. Wow. So that's our division commander. Wow. And I have no recollection of him being there, but he told me this story. He said, the chaplain, Jake Laboon, commander of the United States Navy, was the head of chaplains for the division. And he was in the, in the triage tent as they brought in the guys that were off your helicopters. And he had just given you the last rites when they came out of triage and said, who's next? And Laboon looked up at him and said, take this one. 
and they took you instead of the guy next to you, because otherwise you would probably be dead. So, and, and you understand, Ray Davis was a kind of devout Southern Baptist, never heard a man utter a four letter word. Jake LeBruin said to me, you get down on your knees every day, young man, and you thank God for that Catholic chaplain who saved your life. Wow. That's the kind of people I got to serve with. Oh, that is incredible. And was that, uh, was that where Bill Haskell was wounded? Which one was? Uh, was he- Haskell was wounded on the 25th of May. Now, some days your life, is, and, you, and you know this because you know what it's like. Some days your life, you never forget. I'll never forget the 25th of May. I'll never forget what happened on the night of the 28th, 29th of July. It was horrible, terrible days. And Bill and I, till the day he passed, we remained very, very close friends. And of course, Bill died of what all of, almost all of these guys are dying of now. So far, not me, but cancer yeah. because of Agent Orange. Because we, we swam in it. We drank it. We w- washed our clothes in it. We, uh, we were walking around in it. It rained on us like Agent Orange. I mean, for months, year. I mean, yep. it's just. Oh, the long-term effects of that it makes me think of the, uh, the, the, the smoke just from burning the trash and all these bases in Iraq and Afghanistan, right. all those plastics and everything that uh, a lot of veterans yep. are dealing with, uh, with today. 